Thank you for staying with us. Uh, for the third time in the span of two weeks, uh, organized labor comprising the Nigeria Labor Congress and the Trade Union Congress have again rejected the federal government's new offer of 57,000 naira minimum wage after the federal government and organized private sector proposed a 57,000 naira monthly minimum wage as against the 54,000 naira they proposed on Tuesday when the committee resumed negotiations. The organized labor rejected it, shifting their grounds from their initial 615,000 naira to 497,000 naira. Recall that government had initially proposed 48,000 naira last week, which was also rejected by organized labor. The negotiating committee is yet to agree on a new minimum wage barely 10 days to May the 31st deadline given by labor unions to government for conclusion to uh, for conclusion of uh, negotiations. We're joining us uh, from our Abuja studio is the group CEO, Global Investment and Trade Company, GITC, Baba Yusuf. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Now, what do you make of uh, this back and forth between organized labor, private sector, and the federal government with regards to uh, a new minimum wage. This conversation has been going on for quite a while. The organized labor is saying government is not being sincere uh, with them with regards to this conversation because they are insisting on a particular sum and we have the deadline just a few days away. Thank you very much. It's um, really a a long one for, 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 for Nigeria and for Nigerians, the Nigerian civil servants, and not just the civil servant. It is instructive to note that the entire sectors, private and public, are waiting for the outcome or final position with regards to the minimum wage, or what I call, rather called the living wage. You know, I don't want to consider it minimum wage, because minimum wage may not be a living wage, as we can see because uh, the engagement with the federal government will basically be the benchmark that will now be the basis for, you know, charting or locking down whatever will be the minimum wage, even at subnationals and in the private sector. That being said, the, last, uh, the latest lockdown is expected. We all know that um, the situation is in the country, the cost of living crisis has been escalating. We step a little back, everybody knows. Just look at this for a second and say the price of average price of a loaf of bread, you know, for a family of two or three is 1,500. If you multiply that by the week, uh, you have maybe what, 15,000 a week, 45,000 already. Uh, a staff that is taking transport with an average of 1,000 going and coming. That is 2,000 a day multiplied by five. That is uh, 10,000 already. If you multiply that by the four weeks, you know, already you can see the, the, you know, the cost piling up for the basic subsistent, basically crawling on the floor, you know, cost of living. We have not added the pricing for electricity, you know, for water. We all buy water. You know, government has uh, basically forgotten that uh, I don't know who, how many of Nigerians enjoy pipe bone water. You basically buy pure water or, or, or other forms of water. That being said, I think government should be more practical and pragmatic so that we close this conversation. Because if we look at, we take a step back and look at when this negotiation started till today, what has happened is the inflation rates, whether it is headline or core or food inflation, have been escalating and galloping. And then yesterday also the CBN governor gave us a love letter. We saw the, you know, the rates and the indices which are going to further choke the economy. Uh, yesterday also, interestingly, the president of Angola increased the minimum wage of the civil servants of Angola to $120, you know, uh, uh, in, 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 which is 100,000 kwanzos, if I got it right. You know, in Nigerian, if you change it to Nigerian, you know, Naira, it's about uh, maybe 225, 200, 200, 225 to 230,000 Naira. If you take this baseline data that I've been brandishing about, you realize that really government needs to be very practical with, the, with this uh, minimum or living wage. Because part of the problem, I want to 
you know, touch light a particular area for government to consider while doing this negotiation also. If you want to fight corruption, the first place to start is to deal with living wage. You cannot expect to fight corruption when people barely, you know, survive. But desperate is the people wage do proposed desperate by things. Labor, is, is the living wage proposed by Labour feasible? Labour initially said 615,000 Naira. As that yesterday, from what we have heard, it has been reduced to close to 500,000 Naira. Is that a feasible um, wage that the government will be able to pay? Is that Ibrahim or Theophilus? Sorry, I cannot uh, Theophilus. see from here. Is that Ibrahim? Theophilus. Theophilus. You see, Theophilus, <clears throat> as far as I'm concerned, that number is not feasible. And from where I sit, if I want to do some role playing, I want to believe that that is a number thrown for the purpose of negotiation. Everybody knows that there's no how you can give 620,000 Naira as minimum wage. But what I would like to see is a middle ground conversation where practicality meets, you know, aspirations. While the labor, you know, are looking at 650 as an aspiration, the government looks at practicality. I just gave you numbers earlier. This is baseline numbers which everybody knows with regards to what is feasible. Let us also not forget at subnationals, we've seen some activities happening, which is commendable. Uh, Edo State has jacked up to 70,000. We can see some semblance of acceptance at that level. Uh, yesterday, uh, the negotiations between the Labour at Anambra State and the governor of uh, Anambra, Professor Chukuma Saludo, the outcome was very good. As of yesterday night, they came, they said they were happy with the progress being made. But at the federal level, I would like to see another layer of engagement that will lead to, you know, a win-win situation. I'm not saying government should pay that kind of humongous, impossible amount of money. But I'll also lend my voice to fellow Nigerians because the workers are fellow Nigerians that that amount of 50-something thousand is not tenable. We should look at ways and means to upscale that to what I call the living wage. And then we take it from there to how that will be paid. I understand also government is looking at numbers they can accommodate. But the reality is we must deal with this issue of minimum wage if any sensible governance will happen going forward. Otherwise, this brick abrack will continue and then it will affect governance because the civil servants, the public sector drive, you know, the governance of the country. When we are saying uh, what is uh, deemed, you know, Feasible. We're also talking about the possibility of governors having to, you know, be able to pay this amount. We still know that some states are still having uh, issues uh, handling the minimum wage. Uh, we saw the NLC president yesterday describing, you know, the federal government proposal as uh, unsubstantial. What is deemed normal to you? And what is the amount that you think should be payable, especially what state governments can handle? Okay. I will answer from two perspectives. I think even the labor, from what I can see now, from the body language and the activities in Edo and in uh, Anambra, there should be an understanding that there should be a layer of minimum wage that should be acceptable at federal and state level. And that is why I was saying, looking at the baseline, because definitely at the subnational, going forward, there may be some kind of stratification with regards to living wages in some states. I reckon in the years to come, there won't be a baseline standard, you know, minimum wage that will be at federal that may apply at subnational. Why? Because it is very clear that the states have different measures or different capacities or purchasing powers or the accommodate cost. So that being said, uh, when you talked about what I think should be the minimum, be the minimum, if I look at the numbers I highlighted earlier, which you knew, I wouldn't want to throw a number because I'm not part of the negotiation. Uh, because also we should note, the final figure that will be agreed on will also have what I call a shock effect on inflation. Uh, some of us have been saying it since last year, November, and that is why we wanted the negotiation to be locked down. Because the moment you increase living wages, naturally it will impact on inflation, especially food inflation and all that. Well, that being said, we have to bite that bullet, face that reality, and look at how we can deal with other inflationary trends. Uh, if you ask me, I think the government should look at, without prejudice to whatever they are looking at in terms of numbers that I may not have information, but these numbers with regards to minimum wage should inch towards, you know, the 100,000 Naira 
you know, ceiling if we consider all these factors that we are mentioning, which are the yardstick that should be considered in negotiating the minimum wage. The, uh, the, the living wage should not be determined based on sentiments, but based on realities on the part of government and based on realities also on the part of the labor, labor, labor movement because they have to realize that you cannot take out what is not available. So what is the purchasing power of federal government? What do we have on the table? And what can government save? Because at the end of the day, federal government and state governments must cut some cost to accommodate this increase on, in salary, which is a critical success factor going forward. But I reckon an amount around 100 or a little bit more than that should be a number that some of us will start shouting and say federal government should consider and sit on the table without prejudice again to the numbers behind. But government has to shed weight to accommodate whatever increment will happen. But this 5,000, 7,000 will not cut it. And the longer the negotiation takes, the more difficult it is to meet, you know, at a, at a middle ground that is a win-win. That should be a win-win for all of us. Interesting. Now, you, I'd like for you to perhaps expatiate on an earlier line of thought you were talking about in terms of uh, how this matter of minimum wage or living wage is fueling corruption. Uh, because uh, we need to really understand that aspect, especially for stakeholders to understand so that something substantial can be, can be negotiated at the end of the day be, before perhaps uh, May the 31st. And then again, uh, there are those who have talked about resource control might be the way forward to addressing this matter of uh, living wage, minimum wage at the sub-national level. Sorry, come back with the last line. Control of what as subnational? Sorry? Resource control. Resource control. By oh, resource the... control. Yeah, resource. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Nice one. Nice one. I like that. Okay. <clears throat> there are different types of corruption. And uh, thought leaders and some of us also students of strategy and practical people believe that uh, the fight of, against corruption is a hypocrisy if you look at the, what I call the transactional corruption, i.e. the taking and the giving of bribe or, you know, uh, whatever you call it, uh, graft, whatever. We should go back and look at the con fundamental cause of, uh, of, of corruption. And I believe that a, 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 an employer, in this case, whether it is public sector, whether it is government or private sector, that pays a wage that cannot take the employee home, is morally corrupt. And I stand that and I say that with all sense of responsibility because if your employee can barely feed, if your employee is thinking how he or she can get money to buy anti malaria for her daughter, if your employee is thinking that in the next two months the landlord will come working for, 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 for rent or an employee has an aged mother or a sick father, whereby they require critical medical intervention. And yet, the monthly salary can barely take them halfway into the month. They are perpetually indebted to all manner of service providers and producers. It presupposes that naturally, we know the theory of Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs will play out, and that is, the basic instinct of survival, and that is desperation, is to survive. Morality will no longer be tenable. It is to survive. It is for the mother that is in the hospital to get the last, last punch of blood before she dies so that she will survive. Or my kids must survive for any other things to have reason and logic. It is on that premise I want policy makers and decision makers to think. And this I will also imbibe on the religious leaders and all leaders of thought to come and add their voice to this. You cannot fight corruption without dealing with the fundamental needs of human beings. And that is the take home. If you have, we are still lagging behind in terms of infrastructure. I said it earlier, we buy pure water. We can't even have water in the pipe bone water. And people cannot even afford to buy pure water. Naturally half of your society will be desperate. We already have over 160-something or 30-something million most nationally poor. Let us know that these people do not even belong to this quadrant of people that are struggling to get the living wage. The multidimensionally poor are far below the living wage, ladies and gentlemen. And therefore, we should understand that 
corruption will continue to draw us back as a nation, no matter the strategy, no matter the policy. And if we don't deal with the fundamental catalyst of corruption or enablers of corruption, one of which the key platform is poverty that is driven by one of the factors of paying people far below the living wage, calling it minimum wage. Then the fight of against corruption is a mirage. All the institutions fighting corruption, don't forget, are manned by human beings like us, are part of the civil service structure, are part of the public service structure, the law enforcement officers, the armed forces, the judges, I mean the judiciary, and every other person. So if we won't want to play the ostrich, we need to sit down and eyeball this issue of living wage, such that people <clears throat> have what you believe you have the moral obligation, or the moral right, rather, to challenge them for behaving below par. But when people are, you, you go on the streets of Nigeria, mental health is an issue. People are basically living semi-zombies. Semi and you expect these people to have the rationality to think about what is good or what is bad. I'm not excusing that. But it is a reality. If you go back to the Abraham Maslow, and even the religions, you know, we have provisions within the religion where people that are at the very lowest des desperation can do some things that Almighty God will excuse because of that situation they find themselves in. I implore leaders to look at this from that perspective while negotiating minimum wage. And I, I hope all of us will stop calling it minimum wage, but we'll start looking at it from a living wage perspective going forward. Okay, but in all you have said, which you have um, you've highlighted quite a lot, it still boils down to the fact that government is saying that it is starved of funds to pay the living wage. Yes. That is what government will tell us. With all due respect, we are Nigerians. And if everybody doesn't know, if, if, everybody do, if all of us don't know, some of us know the numbers. And I will not sit down here and be advocating for what is impossible for government. Because I am an employee, I'm an employer. I've run as an employer to the highest level you can imagine in the corporate world as MDCEO. I'm an MDCEO, I'm a business owner, and I'm a patriot. What we are saying is there must be sensitivity in engaging and negotiating the living wage. We believe that a solution can be reached, what I call a win-win. And I believe 50,000 cannot cut it. If we want to be fair and we want to have a conversation with the fear of God, and we don't want to be hypocritical about this, government has to shed weight. There's no running away from it. And if we are saying the money is not available, I will say it's a function of resource control. And I'm sorry, I will go back to, to, to the earlier question that I forgot to answer with regards to the subnationals in terms of resource control. Yes, of course, resource control and through federalism. Mr. President has promised in this renewed hope agenda that he will deal with the issue of true federalism. And I think that will also deal with the issue of disparities of income and, 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 and revenue and payments at the subnational, and everybody will fall in line with regards to that. But it still boils down to the creativity and innovation of governors to generate wealth in their states, to be able to accommodate. They cannot live perpetually with cap in hand in Abuja, collecting monthly allocation and telling us that is the reason why they are leading. Coming back to what you said, Theophilus, the government needs to shed weight. And part of the problem we are having, like we have mentioned, the inflationary trends and all this, you know, running a, a government that is coming, becoming almost a levy-driven government. I'm a proponent of this government. But we need to say the truth when the truth needs to be told. You need to deal with the supply side to checkmate the inflationary trends so that you can have surplus. You cannot continue, you know, creating demands. Because even if government is creating levies, every, it's creating demands. So we need to deal with the supply side. We cannot sit on our hands and say, we cannot accommodate this. We need to deal with this. And we know that there are resources that can be managed for us to be able to achieve not 600,000, not 300,000, but like I said, somewhere around 100,000 and so, and move on. But it is a function of resource control, resource management, and being practical and pragmatic. We need to go back to the drawing board and deconstruct the current policy coordination we have, if there's any. If there's none, there needs to be a strategy. And it is very good timing. 29th of May will be one year anniversary of President Bola Ahano Tinubu's administration. I think there's need to go to, back to the drawing board and re-strategize. 
but we must be practical. We must be God-fearing in looking at this issue. Resources are available. It's a function of management. Talking about being practical, uh, present at the meeting were also uh, representatives of the private sectors. Uh, when we are talking about being <coughs> practical, you know, these sectors are still having, you know, issues handling uh, the current minimum wage. We also need to focus about what the ripple effects of this will be on the economy. Uh, wouldn't private sectors that cannot afford this, private companies, wouldn't it lead to an increase in unemployment, they will have to let go of some of their staffs at this time. Thank you very much for that question. Very important. And while you are at it, you don't add just private sector, the informal sector. It's very dear to me because it should be dear to all of us. 80% of Nigeria's economy is driven by the informal sector, not the formal sector, because I reckon the private sector conversation may be taking the chunk of the private sector. And with regards to the purchasing power or the capacity, financial or liquidity, if you like, of the private sector, vis-a-vis -vis the final outcome of this conversation is also a reality we have to face. I totally agree. But then what I will find its way when we deal with that. But we cannot say because of that we will not deal with the fundamental issue of the living wage. But I agree with you. And that is why I was saying earlier on, I was preempting this question by saying government should look at ways and means to turn the tide of inflation by dealing with the supply side, for example. You know, the cost of doing business is escalating every day. Yesterday, the NPR outcome, I was not serious. I was not happy with it because already those new numbers that have been churned are going to further choke SMEs. They are going to yes. further choke even the bigger businesses. And at the end of the day, just not about transferring the cost to the service providers, but government, the business owners will start looking also have to have operational efficiency, cost efficiencies. And one of the ways right. I, I, it will happen maybe offloading people, you know. So there needs to be circumspection and a holistic view with regards to this. But definitely there will be shocks in the short term. The only way is All for right. government to go back, like I said, to re-strategize so that there will be a curve turnaround of the economy in the midterm. But in the short term, it's not looking good. That's our reality. Baba Yusuf. Uh